Welcome to another edition of the Swim Swam podcast. I am not Coleman Hodges. I am Braden Keith, uh, sitting in for Coleman today. And today we're joined by Tom Shields, two-time Olympic gold medalist. How's it going, Tom? Good. How are you, Rick? trip away yeah it is we moved over to the city so um it's very nice being here and actually getting to experience it for a little bit unfortunately i was sick right away so that experience is actually just beginning like today and yesterday but um it's nice being on this side of the bay and um trying to shit out you know yeah so let's talk about you being sick at short course worlds you know um your first couple races everybody was wondering what was going on (coughs) tom's been swimming so well all fall and then all of a sudden you show, you show up at short course worlds. It wasn't going great. Uh, at the time you said diarrhea turned into pneumonia. Can you kind of walk us through what happened? Yeah. I mean, I, I had kind of had like a gut issue off. I mean, for the last couple of years, like I, and I've been on like, uh, like I had really bad heartburn and now I'm on like long-term of, uh, a meprazole or whatever that is. Um, Prilosec to try and, I don't know. But I'm not going to bore you with the details, but either way, like, so like, there's, there's some going on there. And like, um, I had obviously put on a little bit of weight or a lot of bit of weight towards the end of the fall. And so like, I was coaching myself slash running things by Dave and my thought process was like, let's just taper for it all or like be pretty ready to go. Kind of blunt object rest is like the way I would call it. Like I wasn't very sharp, uh, anywhere except for like maybe hungry. Um, and outside of that, and like, if you will look at my graph, it was like better, 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 hungry, worse, 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 worse. <laughs> so like, I don't know if I had the flu by there. So yeah, I did get pneumonia. Um, so if I do take a coughing break at any point of this um, conversation, I apologize. But uh, I don't know if I had flu there. I think like, you know, after the ISL final, I was like, oh, I need to like work myself out of this. Like the playoffs didn't really go that well. Um, and so I kind of did like a 10 session week and I lifted a lot and it, that didn't work out, you know? And so like, but it was something that I was comfortable with. And like, I was pretty fed up with like, just kind of doing like the fancy pants, like go to the pool and do 2000. Like I kind of wanted to work out again. Um, so I, I think it was worth it. Like, I think that, yeah, like, uh, fortunately the one time the team like needed me to be good, I was good on the final of the 200 medley and, um, Tej was was good enough on the um, 400 medley. He took care of business there. So, um, you know, whenever you're taking a spot and you end up not in an ideal position, you, there's a little bit of guilt that comes with that. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, like I definitely have never been the worst one at that. But uh, this is the first short course world where I was like totally beefed one. So I was pretty bummed. Um, but to answer your question, I don't know if I had the flu there. Um, because like I didn't get a fever until like the 25th um which is like five days since we've been home so like I think it was like working out out here or got it on the plane or maybe I just had it all along um and got home and like I was really excited to like work out at a full strength again so I like lifted for two hours both the first two days home and then I swam for two hours and like six gable sessions and I was like yeah okay cool and then like my plan was to go on a working vacation to Hawaii and swim out at uh, Punahou or UH where we did our uh, Olympic camp I met some of the staff out there and Folker um, my college weight coach is coaching out there so it was just like a perfect little plan and then my body was like you haven't taken a day off in like over 80 days. So I'm going to shut down now. (laughs) I think it was really just like a lack of logistical awareness of where I was energy wise Um, that led to both worlds and me being sick. But I don't think I can sit here and be like, I had, because I I didn't have pneumonia at worlds. Like I I know what it feels like. I've had it twice now. And like I sleep, I'm a terrible sleeper and I sleep 16 hours a day. So like, obviously that wasn't the case at worlds. So, um, you know, you were gone for a long time, you know, between Mm. the Olympics, the training camp, ISL, uh, world cups, short course worlds. You were, I mean, other than, than about two weeks, you were home in California, a week and a half, you were home in California. You were gone for about six months. Do you think that that contributed to the toll at all? I mean, you've never done anything like that before. Have you? (laughs) Yeah. And I think like you, you look at the others, um, who did similar things, um, 
And like uh, a perfect instance is the other um, guy I can think of right now who did that schedule, at least through the ISL final, um, Chalmers. You know what I mean? He had a very similar graph. Um, he held on two more meets than I did through um, the World Cups. He's, you know, he said he had, he had his best swims and his world record performance in Russia. And um, again, you know, in Doha, I wasn't feeling well. I got sick, but like whatever. And then like kind of frayed off of that at, at ISL. And like maybe that's due to lack of focus or – or what have you. And I haven't followed up with him um, since then to see if he, he's been sick. I think we've talked maybe once, but uh, uh, and then you look at like um, a couple of the other Australian girls who, who did get sick or Kira did that same schedule and she even had Europeans. She got sick. Um, and it, I don't think that was COVID. Um, I know some of the Aussie girls did get COVID. Um, but blah, blah, whatever. So I think like it's, a, it's not unsustainable. <laughs> Um, because like Jesse was fine. Um, the people who got COVID seemed to be fine after they came back. And like, that's just the nature of this year. Um, like Sabo was fine at worlds. Um, I know he probably wanted a better result, but like physically he was fine. Um, so do you think, I mean, in, in lots of pro sports, NFL, NBA, soccer players, we see athletes gone, for six, seven, eight months a year. Um, we don't, you know, we kind of see a lot of swimmers are hesitant, especially American swimmers seem to be hesitant to do that. Why do you think that is? To, to have an off season? Well, they're, why are they hesitant to be away from home for over oh, half a year? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think <laughs> um, to be as nice as I can say it, I think that like, Swimming is a pretty privileged sport and it's uh, people have had a hobby mindset and an amateurish mindset to it for a long time. And I think when uh, like they think that Michael was in the lab 11 months a year um, and by the lab, I mean, like at home working out. And it's like that's that's not the Michael I ever knew. You know, like I don't know the 04 to 08 run as well as I know the runs that I was on the national team. Um, but it's like that dude was like scoring in the world cups isn't what it is today obviously but um he was like second or third overall which didn't pay out in 2011 and he only went to like two or three but he like in the world cup series short course meters in 2011 like this guy if maybe he's a home body but um he was like definitely out there like doing random meets in canada going like 156 or 155 in the two fly like he was so willing to to go win things um just not short course worlds and so everyone thinks that like he he never did anything um and they try and map themselves onto that or use that as some excuse or like i don't view that um as what michael did um that's not you know the michael i ever saw and um i think when you have someone like that in the sport like everyone kind of thinks about like their version or their interpretation of what he did is and excuse what they do right and that's 100 percent what i'm doing right now <laughs> um <laughs> But like, I, I don't know, you know, I think like a lot of people play at this, um, in my opinion. I, I think that that's becoming exposed more now. It's like the opportunity now is greater than it's ever been. And there was like a good collective of us that are realizing that. And like, um, you know, this year in particular, when you talk about like money in the sport, um, obviously, you know, I'm sure the contracts and the, the private sponsorships and money you know the the earnings that you don't hear about are are great value but those go to um like one or two people per country per cycle um and if you reach that next threshold like phelps and i saw soon yang recently i just saw the headline but i you guys put that out that he made a bunch of money half a million i mean that's really cool if you get to do that and i think but like to to put a whole generation of swimmers focused on like having that happen it's like, guys, it's not like going to happen. And uh, I've literally been in conversation with that. It's like, I've been on a cereal box in every store in the country. Um, and that's not going to happen for me. You know what I mean? And it's like, so I'm a lot closer to that throwing over like night talk shows, blah, blah, than a lot of these other kids are. And it's still never going to happen. Do you um, think so like, when you think about like the professionalism that's available um, and the opportunity that's available to us, like the group that did it. And I think Kira is obviously a great example um, and a couple, you know, the, the Dutch team, um, not just Kira, but like the, the crew that they roll around with and uh, how the the Aussies did this fall this way. Um, the, the group that specifically did it because they couldn't get back in the country. Right. But a lot of Aussies have historically gone to the World Cups, just not those five. Right. But 
I don't know, dude. Like, it's been kind of frustrating having these conversations because everyone's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Like, well, that's why you struggle in the summer, or blah, 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 like this, this or that. And it's like, dude, I don't know, man. Because like when everyone was forced to do the fall short course because that was the only game in town, uh, who was winning those events and who won trials and or the games? Right. So, same name. Do you think 22 year old you, I mean, if, if we're being honest, you're probably past the point of your career where you're going to win an Olympic individual Olympic gold medal. Do you think 22 year old you what? Who still had design, <laughs> who still had designs on winning the hundred fly at the Olympics would have been convinced by this, or is this Tom looking for another path in his career? No, I think this has been my opinion the long, uh, for a long time. I think when I was 22, I'm trying to do the math here. Um, so let's just say 20, 21. That's 2012, right? So that I got fourth at trials. And then the next year, um, I didn't make the world's team. And I went to the World Cups and I made like 30 grand. Um, and that was what kept me in the sport. And thankfully, um, Arena signed me anyways, even though I missed that 2013 uh, world's team. Um, or I should say a company signed me anyways. Um, <laughs> I love to you. <laughs> And uh, no, and I'm very thankful to them for that. Like, of course, that's a huge deal. Um, but if you ask me then, like, oh, do you think you have, you know, machinations or ability to win an Olympic gold medal in this event? I'd be like, yeah, nah. <laughs> so like, I don't know if that's like where my mindset is. And like, maybe that has been a detriment to my, um, you know, output in that field. But I, I, I don't know, like if that, you know, ever mattered. Because I think like guys who end up on the podium there don't like think about needing to win like i've known the two that have um for a while now is that of it um you know the way that i view my career now as i got older it's like you know i was michael second and i challenged him when i could and so yeah when i was a little bit older than that 22 um you know when i you know in 2014 i was able to beat him and then i was like trying to get some faith together but like it was still like i never really felt like there was a huge shot or that wasn't what like i thought about when i went to bed you know what i mean like when I focused on my career, it's like, how do we grow like everyone's income and how do we grow like the odds of success um, for not only the first through eight, but like the whole sport? Because it's like the winning side of things is like important. And that's like very motivating to a young person. And like by young, I mean like a 12 year old, um, you know, what I mean, like, like, oh, I want to win the Olympics. But it's like once you're once I was in the culture, I was like, hey, we're getting kind of boned here. <laughs> like we could do better than this. And I've obviously um, fallen in line with Constantine's vision that I think exposure and hours of content is a huge part of that. And I think that um, there's still like a hole um, to fill for that. And like I obviously believe in short course and there's a lot of personal bias there, but um, you know, I, I, who knows what the answer is, but I think to answer your question, I know this has been very long. Um, no, I don't think that that was like ever a motivating factor and that, um, you know, continuing to live and breathe inside and like have, you know, have a future and, and, and create this like professionalism outside of that. You know what I mean? Like those five or six people in the world that make, um, like lifelong money in the games is great. And they should never not do that. But like for the rest of us, and I mean that as the rest of us is like, I don't mean to brag to say that I was sponsored by Kellogg's, but like I had a mainstream US Olympic partner and I knew that that wasn't available for me. Cause it's just like, I don't have an Olympics at 15 or 16 or 17 or 18. And then an Olympics after that, where I get a bunch of medals and now I'm where I'm at. Like, no, I'm a rookie at 26. Right. So like, it's a very different so scenario. I don't know. You know, I, hopefully that makes sense. What I'm trying to say. So we did the math. Do you know how much money you made from Olympics through short course worlds? Have you done the math? Well, that's just public. Right. So it's like, um, I think it's like, it's like 198 to 203. We got 217,925, including okay. your operation, including your operation gold money. So your cut of uh, the uh, Olympic uh, medal relay. So um, that's $217,000 for mm -hmm. essentially six months of work. With that yep. in mind, if a talented collegiate swimmer or a talented, let's say, high school senior was considering this or NCAA swimming, would you still tell them to go to NCAA swimming or would you recommend this? Um, let's say Tom, let's say 18-year-old Tom, you were a great high school swimmer. You knew you had it in short course. 
<laughs> so that's the thing. Um, what a lot of juniors lack is consistency and knowledge. And like, yes, I was able to do that this year on my like 12th try. Right. And like that, like, but you look at me where I was at 18. I of course wasn't available, you know, wasn't capable of doing that at 18. Now, like you look at a guy who's won the world cups many times, who's my age, Chad, he started doing that when he was 18 and like, he's made a good living for himself. Um, and it's hard to tell a foreigner to come to the U S cause I believe um, many U S programs will like take you in, like coach you up, make you better, get you to institute two ways. But a lot of American coaches will then shift focus towards, you know, the U S passport holders, right. Cause that's what furthers their career in the summer. And I think that like, that didn't used to be the case, um, you know, with the heavy foreign programs. Um, Auburn comes to mind. <laughs> like they had a lot of foreigners right. um, there for at least parts of the year. And those, you know, I don't know if, if Marsh and, and Durden and those guys continued to work with them after that, but they had great summer success. Right. And so I don't know what the shift was in the United States. I know Durden, you know, goes, uh, I'm not, I'm not alleging that Durden is, is, a, uh, is uh, at fault for this. I think he goes, you know, above and beyond when guys are out of town, um, especially foreigners or like when things are difficult like that. But um, so that's like the other side of things with when you're talking to foreigners come here and, and like I was talking to Noe or no, I don't know how to say his name. Um, the bronze mark. <laughs> yeah, uh, Ponty. And um, we never introduced these, ourselves. We were just, you know, chatting. And, and we never talked about the specifics of it. But I was just like, oh, like, are you heading back? And he's like, ah, you know, I don't know. Um, so I, I don't have any answers for that here. But I just like he had a good world. And yeah, he has good opportunities coming up in front of him. And he's got good skills. Right. And he's got a system behind him. And so it's like we, when I when you talk to these kids and you know, I actually do, you know what I mean? Like I, I talk to states and I talk to these guys. Um, it, it's so specific to their situation. And like, is this, is that money? Like, is that real money where you live? Um, can you do it in a sustainable fashion? Like Daya doesn't come to the first two and comes the last two this year, therefore screwing over his own chance to win. Um, and then picks up the 200 breast instead of the 200 fly in Russia. That's why I beat Arno. Right. Like I didn't beat Arno. You know what I mean? Like we right. had a contest and it's not a one V one. It's a bunch of other people making a bunch of other decisions. So there's so much chaos in that. Especially it's when like, it's not you, that deep of a field. Yeah. It's like, can you reliably um, like perform in that scenario where I haven't been able to, I I've been, you know, parts of my career have been good enough too, but like you really got to be pushing the world records to, to rely on that. Um, and then outside of that, it's like, can you tolerate those risks at 18? Like, I just like, is that over the guarantee, especially as a foreigner um, of a four year, you know, paid degree. Um, and as an American, like whatever, whatever reason, you know, four year full offers seem to go a little bit, you have to be a little bit better. Um, so I'm talking to like a little bit less of a crowd when I'm talking to Americans, but um, still it's a guaranteed like incubation period. And then, you know, you're pretty quick to 21 and then you learned what you learned and then you can go on and be professional. That's like a great option. And so uh, at this point, like, is that enough money? Um, and can enough people get that much money to offset that benefit and then where are you going if you're going to be an American like if you're going to be an American and try and make the American team which still has financial upsides like that gold medal operation gold um was great but that's not the value of a gold medal like it lives outside of that right um if you're going to be that guy who's going to get on that team like no one's ever made the American team not from an American system there's been a couple who've tried I've had a teammate go to Australia and try it's just difficult and uh, tried it. Yeah. It, it's just difficult to get. Oh, she did. Yeah, you're right. Marce. Um, to get those coaches to understand and commit that it's not just like their trials. And then like, I know it was COVID and it's, and that was probably highlighted 
um, a little bit more because like there was only pockets of the country that could get moving. But uh, I think in 2021, more than ever, you saw very few individuals make the team. Like, I mean, Michael made the team, but you, I could argue he's not an individual. He's a part of a system and a framework that's just about his swimming. And I think that that's, you know, a very South African way to do professional swimming. So that makes sense for his family's background. Um, but everybody else, like the, almost nobody made the team one-off. So you're talking you know, guys like Jason Lezak, who are kind of one-man show wherever they're yeah, training. Like that's kind of over. Right. And even him, it's like, are you, are you that guy? Right. Only he was that guy and only when he was 25 right. and forward or whatever age, he, he became one of the better in the world. Um, but it's like, no, you saw groups of like Florida make the team and Cal make the team and Texas put a condition on the team and, and the Stanford, you know, put a condition on the team. And so it's like, if you're going to step outside college, I, unfortunately, there's no path forward for that right now. Like, I think that there's a couple you know, things are shifting around in the market and we'll see if that, um, you know, like uh, Trent. Um, Jeff Julian. Down at, yes, uh, so I can remember his name. Mission I Vienna. Would say Julian, but I shouldn't. I, I, so yes, Jeff and uh, his wife are taking over a group. And I know um, that was an answer to, or whatever, whatever Schubert's doing. I haven't really read up on it, but you know what I mean? So like there might be some shifting in the, in the, in the tides, if you will, but I don't know if there's enough there right now, you know, but I, I would love for that to be a case, but like, I'm also a huge fan of education. Like, I think that there's a lot to swimming in college. that's not swimming in college. Do you think the ISL could provide an answer for that? If, you know, we know where the ISL is in development and I know you're, you're very high on the ISL and what they're trying to do. But mm -hmm. if we look at it realistically, they haven't necessarily been successful in making this, this whole pro swim league feel like a pro swim league, but in the long term. Um, do you think ISL professional training groups could be a sort of a new um, avenue in that world? From my understanding, and I don't mean to speak out of turn because I thought that this was rather public, um, that that has been the plan. I, I know that teams have definitely been proposing it, uh, but sometimes in the ISL, what's talked about and what happens are not oh, the same thing. Course. I think when anything is in its infancy and things are moving so fast, um, and like the dreams are rather large. Right. Um, yeah. Things shift. But I, I, from my understanding, like I would, I would love that. And um, I don't know if that's what you have to do. I would, haven't spoken, with you, but you know what I mean? Like who knows, but like, um, would you I know be comfortable that just training with whatever coaches coach the team that you signed with or. Well, that's like a part of your decisions, right? Like if you um, have the decision. So, you know, if you're not drafted, well, I, I'm in free agency now. Well, that's part of it too. It's like, that's what I'm getting at when I said that there's a lot of like, swimming is a very privileged sport. And it's like, a lot of these guys have this like cognitive dissonance of like, I mean, I've been saying like a lot because I'm just trying to go slow and make sure I'm choosing my words correctly. I, I apologize. There's a lot of dudes that I know that have a lot, a lot of cognitive dissonance because they will watch eight hours of football on Sunday and NBA all week and come to practice and talk about how they're unwilling to do this, this, and this, and this, like be coached by whoever I'm told, like whoever I'm drafted by or travel all the time. And it's like, how, like, how do you think they got that successful or like the sport to where it was? It's a full-time <laughs> job. I mean, it's like two full-time jobs. It's, it's your full-time <laughs> job on the court and then your full-time job off the court. Yeah. And it's like, I get it, man. Like we were the first swim meet ever to be in a foreign country on Christmas as an American, like with many, many Americans at it. Like I participated in it. I mean, not, not Christmas, um, on Thanksgiving. Right. And it's like, what do you do when you go to Thanksgiving? Oh, I sit down and I watch football. Yeah. It, because they're playing on Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense though. Right. Yeah. Like, right. You want to be on when everyone else is off so they can actually watch you. And it's like, I understand we're not competing with football. And I understand that that because if we were in an American market, maybe competing on Thanksgiving isn't a good idea. I've heard all of that. But my point in this is like, we have to shift our attitudes towards a little bit more like of, we got to do this as a lifestyle. Like we can't just. What do you think it. is going to shift that? Is it just going to be a generation that's going to grow up with yeah. it? Yeah. I, that's, I, 
I, that was the other thing I was going to say. Money, of course, helps. And, you know, the ISL is, is bringing attention to that. And um, then I think people, <clears throat> yeah, growing up with it, shifting towards that. And like, I know Aqua Centurions just um, had a home base pool thing. I don't read Italian or speak it, but I'll follow Matteo Revolta on Instagram. You should too. <laughs> and they did some kind of like inaugural swim thing. And I know I've trained it um, hungry enough to know that iron is, you know, there's a bunch of kids wearing team iron caps. So like, um, like that, those like youth development programs are like also a huge focus for, for KG. I know that I've heard him talk about it. And um, I think that that's wonderful. And I think that that's like it, it, their model, it, you know, when they think about professional sports, they don't really think about football or basketball. They think about their football. And so that model is like pretty interesting, like home base, a lot of youth sports, a lot of youth outreach and um, within the stadium systems, at least from what I'm told, um, I don't know. And I think that that's like a cool way to go and a cool way to do the way we do sports. Cause like so much of our eyes are like 12 and, and younger. And then people who kind of were involved in the culture as adults. Um, and until we, you know, who knows if we ever grow out to be like beyond a niche, I don't think that's possible. Um, but that is but, the vision of the ISL, right? Constantine believes that it can be beyond that niche. Well, that, that niche sports is such a weird perspective. Cause like, it's all moments, right? And like wherever you live, those like the dominant sports dominate until they don't. You know what I mean? Like I was a fan of a niche sport forever growing up um, that now when I go to the pool, I overhear two people talking to each other about unaware of my fandom of it. UFC. What sport is that? In the May. Oh, yeah. Like I grew up in an area where MMA was kind of a thing. So I was aware of it. You know, I would watch it at my girlfriend's house. Like her dad was a big fan and blah, blah, blah. And so like I got into it too. And now to see where it is now and like how much part of the culture it is. And it's like, that is cool. And it'll probably stick around until it doesn't. And like, you can kind of say the same thing about basketball. Like basketball is probably number one right now, but it wasn't until pretty recently in, in American history, like, right? In the scheme of uh, sports. Yeah. And so it's like, who knows? You know what I mean? Like, I doubt basketball will fade it back into niche in our lifetime. Um, but football but, might. Yeah. football With, the, with might. the head injury issues, football might. I mean, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't, all of my friends stopped watching um, for one reason or another. It's just like the games are long as hell, too. Yeah. Um, I never watched either. Right. Like I watched baseball as a kid. And like now it's full blown niche. Like. They're, I mean, they do better numbers outside of the U.S. than inside. Well, baseball is essentially a merchandising industry at this point. Yeah. It's hats and jerseys and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So speaking, speaking ISL and money, I've got to ask this question. Have you guys been paid for season three yet? Um, I'm not the accountant in the family. <laughs> Um, Gianna, Gianna, <laughs> she's not home. Um, I would assume that I mean, I've, uh, maybe gotten the stipend or whatever. I'm not expecting um, any of the prize money to be paid by now. And I think that like, there's a little bit of a caveat that I have with this, that um, I've, I need people to know, like I've been paid in the overall in the world cups a few times. I've never been paid all of my money before the next world cup start. Uh, before the now. next year's start or before yeah. the next meet? Okay. Like in 2014, really? I got over, I, I won six figures in 2014. Um, I got pneumonia and I almost, I was pushing to win or get second, but then I got third um, in the overall. And there was a lot more money for like the top three back then. Um, now it's a little bit more spread out um, is the world cup model, which I think that's their answer to the ISL. Um, but anyways, so like not that many people got that much money. So like, it wasn't that loud how long it took for us to get paid. And it was always the same things like, Oh, drug testing needs to come through or this, or we're waiting for that or blah, blah. And then they send it to USA swimming and like USA swimming, put their foot down and says no more cash at the world cups. Like they used to pay the metal money in cash. So you would at least have that in hand. And now um, I don't know who it wasn't me, but somebody got audited and didn't claim that. And USA swimming is like a nanny state is their like opinion on life. So I, I saw, 
I saw Swimming Canada sent out an email to all of their athletes saying, Swim Swam will report how much money you've made. So you better pay your taxes. Yeah. And also, like, that's like my crime. <laughs> Like I'm a big liberty guy. Who are you to tell me that I, you know, can or can't? Like, if I commit a crime and they catch me, then I will pay the fees or go to jail. Like, but it's my money. Like, there's a, right. I'm on a different side of it because, like, if you could go to a weekend and make five or six k in metal money and then point towards like a six figure salary that will be paid a year from now, it's really nice to have that money in hand and go home and pay your bills. But now I have to wait for it to be wired in with everything else. And then, of course, you say, swimming. they said, well, we only pay out on Fridays. And it came in on a Thursday. We couldn't process it in time. So we're going to hold on to a week. And, oh, we get to make this, like, small little interest on it. <laughs> it feels like. And, like, that's what everybody's doing. It's like, why would I pay out $5 million now when I can make however much interest and then pay out? And, like, I think at this point, like, I mean, there was drug testing at ISL. Like, we should wait for those to come through at 100%. And... Um, I think like the only thing that's changed now is more people are making more money. So it's like this, like loud complaints, um, in terms of like payment stuff, like I would love to be paid faster. I would never say that, like, don't complain about that. But like, it's actually for me, when I hear that, it's like, oh, this is cool. Like more people are in, involved in this situation than like ever before. Like, whereas in 2014, there was, uh, you know, Katinka, um, whoever the bottom two girls were, but she made like 600,000 a year. And then gear to myself and Chad that were really the only ones that made like enough money that you would feel not getting it right away. Right. Um, and it's like, I don't know. I was talking to a friend and it's like, it's really cool that this is happening. And, uh, and it's like, but like whenever I say like, Oh, you have to be patient or like, this is the way the world cups were too. Like people would come and like attack me and be like, Oh, but like people are like relying on this, like they need it now to like pay the rents and like people aren't as successful as you and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, yeah, I was on government assistance, like PUA through the pandemic because I was 17th in the world. Um, I'd blown a lot of my money and not invested well and not saved. And it goes by way faster than you think it does. <laughs> Let me tell you when I was younger. Um, and that's why Gianna's in charge of the money now. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, at least like monitoring it and being like, hey, like let's like let's make decisions on what we spend money on and not just buy like every book and car we see or whatever. Um, Or like get into like a new hobby. Books and cars. Those are the two categories of blowing money, right? Well, I'm lying. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, I I got into spearfishing and I was like, oh, I need like the best fins on the market. And it's like, no, you don't. So I'm learning as I get older that um, I just bought myself a nice fence on the market though. (laughs) But I waited until I had money. Um, but no, anyway, I was on like government unemployment, like you were swimming expanded the money that they were paying out during the pandemic. Like we're going to take care of the national team, blah, blah, blah. But they didn't go, they didn't expand it to 17 to 24. I was told I was going to get a phone call and see if they could help out like the returning Olympians. I never got that phone call. Um, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I recently heard the year before the Olympics, um, something like they funded like a third of the team that were to make it. I don't know if that's true, but I know it's under half or if it's a half, it's like barely half. And it's like, there's frustrations in that. So it's like assuming that like, I can't, I'm not going to use that ISL money to survive either. Like I went to ISL season two, um, not having my full season one money. And I was in a do or die. Like I am on government assistance. I need to make money here. And then when I didn't get that money right away, yeah, that's frustrating. But like, I understand that that was part of the game because of my prior experience um, in making money in the fall in general. And I don't know why it's different. Um, Why like I, I had been paid out from like in 2016 when I made, I got like six or seven medals at short course worlds. I'd been paid out way faster than that, than the world cups that I had been. Um, I don't know. Meet series are weird and hard and like they're a logistical nightmare. Like meet the world cup team, meet the ISL team, especially like the, you know, like the last day, like it's a nightmare. And like, were you, I mean, were you bothered specifically by the fact that with the, with the COVID year, ISL said, we're going to make these regular payments that, you know, they, they put out, they put some PR behind the idea that they were putting out these regular payments to athletes to help them get through the mm-hmm. pandemic. And then didn't, you know, I I get what you're saying about the prize money and and that kind of happens. But when they said publicly, they were going to do it for this way, this way, for these reasons, and then didn't, is that a a bigger sin? I wasn't, 
I'm, I have no idea. What it was supposed happened. to be like monthly solidarity payments. And then it became quarterly. And then they all showed up at once at the end of the year. Yeah. Something. And I think this is the problem of like, I don't read any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean? Like um, I, I had had a, a separate deal with them and I'm happy with it. Um, uh, if yeah, I don't, I never heard the monthly part of it. Um, I had just heard that it was like this much per month. Um, which means different, like that doesn't necessarily mean monthly. Right. At least that's how I understood it. But I don't, I don't know. I'm not that guy. Right. Um, uh, I'll, uh, this like one of my coworkers gets mad at me about this. Like, we'll talk about like a, you know, a deal or, or, or specifics. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I didn't read that. <laughs> and like, I, I have, I've worked with good agents in the past. Like we're negotiating a deal now and um, Gianna's, doing the red lining. I'm just, I, I don't know. I'm not the legal department. I've never been that guy. You know, um, I, I, I wish that that um, this scenario was better with the ISL. I'm not going to lie about that. But I also think that like, like I was saying, I think that it's also indicative that, you know, more people are involved, but um, so um, that's a good thing, you know? So you have sort of a special relationship with the ISL and, and I'm, Sure, because it's ongoing litigation, you're not allowed to talk about it, but you are one of the named plaintiffs in the ongoing lawsuit against FINA, which is ostensibly athletes versus FINA, but is also kind of ISL versus um, FINA. Um, in I can't, well, there, there's two, there's two cases. Um, there's like the class or class action case, and then there's ISL's case. With right. And so, you know, you, you kind of, I guess have been on this from the beginning, so to speak. You know, you don't read all the paperwork, but you've been in the conversations since the beginning. That's the one. Like, I have one thing in my life that, like, I answer every email. Yeah, I do everything I can for. Right, and it's this. This is the like. This has been my focus. So, do, I guess this is kind of a two part question. Mm -hmm. um, one part being, do, does the ISL listen to athletes, for example, when they complain about not getting paid quickly enough? In part two being, do you think the ISL has too much sort of influence via the Athletes Association where the Athletes Association would never really be able to push back on the ISL as it's currently structured? Um, because it is funded by Konstantin Gregorishin, who also funds the ISL. At, at this point, the Athlete Association in the league are – legally separate entities but in reality we know they're being operated closely together yeah i i mean yeah i think i have a special relationship with the isl um in that i'm involved in the lawsuit i mean michael wasn't in the league this year he's involved in the lawsuit too um i think that it pretty much ends there and like all i mean by special is like i think i met um, a couple people involved in like the business side of ISL earlier than other people would have just because they were in the room. Like I met a bunch of lawyers. <laughs> I know them. You know what I mean? Like, I don't really talk to the ISL about their case. I don't think that would be right. And I don't know if I, I don't want to talk to anyone about the case because I just don't want to screw up that. Right. Don't talk about this thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I talked to my lawyers about it and I talked to Michael Gutinka when it's appropriate about it. Um, and as far as like listening about the money, I think they have. I think um, they've said this and I said this from the get go after season one had ended. I was like, hey, why are you putting dates on this? Just say you'll pay us. And like, we'll have to trust that the money's coming. And like a lot of the anger was like, well, the money was due on this day. And I blah, blah, blah. Do you think athletes agents would allow them to sign something without dates on it? See, that's a separate issue. Um, who knows? Um, but that's not necessarily what they did, uh, at least from my conversation with them. Like that was just like on there as a blanket anyways. And like that's for like specific individuals. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I think as we as the league grows and like everyone gets, you know, booked out of their minds with agents and stuff. Of course, like that would be great. But like holding out of ISL at this point and having it be felt is a very short list. Right. Um, that's just the nature of the sport. Right. Um, if Caleb and, doesn't show up, everybody notices. If exactly. Erica Brown doesn't show up. 
I don't, we don't need to name names. She's a great swimmer. Yeah. But yeah, you get, you get what I'm saying. And that's just, that's always been the nature of these niche sports. Right. And it's like, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's like, for me, it's like they're the only game in town. <clears throat> and I think for a lot of these guys. And so it's, you can move on from swimming and, and do a professional life. Or if you're from a smaller country, um, represent them on the national stage, or if you're like a long course specialist American, um, go that route. But every long course specialist American that I know and I'm friends with loves the ISL. Um, I mean, specifically Pebbly and Harding. Um, so like when you break it down to individuals, like, you know, people make different decisions in their lives. That's fine. Um, who knows? Like I'm not their agents. I'm not those athletes. I'm not going to pretend to answer that question, but to get back to what you're saying about, I think the Alliance has been on the forefront of this. Like I've talked on behalf of the Alliance, like I've brought it up, like, Hey, like take care of the money stuff. And I know Matt and a couple others have like, you know, we've sent letters and, you know, thing, official things have done, but at this juncture, the Alliance is not a walkout um, Alliance. There's um, no, um, there's actually a promise of no threat um, of boycott or walking out. From I mean, ISL or Olympic tour world championships. From anything. Okay. And my understanding, because that was, um, learning this when you're on a board and you're doing things, whatever your opinion is, you have to shift your opinion to what the one that won, the one that won was and defend that. Um, that was the case because nobody wanted to sign up. They, everyone was going to risk. Everyone was thought there was a huge risk that if they signed up, they would be uh, in the union or whatever. And then if the union walks out or boycotts or strikes, then they have to as well. Which creates so, a lot of conflicts for swimmers from various countries. And then there's the cultural gap of in America. Um, there's a culture gap in America for collective action right. as well. But I mean, imagine, you know, 180 different countries or, or what have you, or in the ISL, however many. Well, and it's uh, some of the athletes are employed by the national army, for example, and you can't, yeah. you and can't so protest the that, army. That makes sense, but the complaints and who I was hearing them from, they weren't those people. Right. Um, I will say that much. And I always thought that was weird. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I basically outed myself that I wasn't for that uh, out of the gates. Um, I just like, that's your bargaining power. Um, so that being said, like the, the Alliance only can do so much. That wasn't in there um, by request of uh, Kudrev or Gagorshin. That was in there by the request of the majority of athletes that did sign up. Which is the CEO uh, and founder yeah. of ISL for people who don't know. Sorry. Yes. A hundred percent. So I don't know what you want us, you know what I mean? Right. Do you think you would continue to race if the ISL, I don't want to wish poorly on the ISL because ISL is a great opportunity, but in a scenario mm -hmm. where it froze for a year or, or ceased to exist, do you think you would have the motivation to keep competing? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think my career now that I'm almost two seconds behind Caleb, um, like I'm his second in a lot of ways is the way that I view it. And so someone comes and takes it from me, um, which I mean, I, I don't put my odds. I'm making the world seem very high this year after gaining a lot of weight and getting pneumonia, but, um, and like, I want to help the, you know, the crew out. And I think that like, this is a lot of what I've been repeating over and over again to use swimming. It's like not necessarily me as an individual, but uh, like one day I will move on and one day I won't be able to go 51 low anymore. Um, I'd love to go 50 point <laughs> before that happens, but we'll see. Right. Um, and it's like, are you, the relay problem that we're having from my end, like my perspective of it is a, from a B relay perspective on the medley. And it's like, I know that a lot of like conversations are being happened around or are being had around restructuring how we do free relays um, in terms of funding and, and motivating the relays and blah, blah, blah. And I think that's all well and good, but it's like, guys, we were tied for seventh and didn't have a swim off because someone got DQ'd. And if I don't go on government assistance and just by pure numbers, like if there was decay in my swimming, through those four sessions, but like, you know, I had two prelims and then a sleep and a semi and then that same night, a prelim. And um, maybe someone younger can, like, that's not a huge workload. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not gonna say that Coleman or Luca or whoever was in the top five, Trenton, I forget, um, couldn't 
have taken my place and gone 51 mid there. You know what I mean? I, those guys are very good athletes. But my point is like, because like I was at 51 one. And so if you add the same decay to their times, like we don't make it back. Like that's just the fact of it. And so it's like, I was on government assistance. I did this because I wanted to um, and because of the ISL. Um, but, and you could say that to anyone, like, let's say Blake just said, ah, screw this. You know what I mean? And like, it, it's different, like uh, depending on who's behind them. Um, it, it's, you can't play this game, you know, hundred percent of the time, but you get, I think my point can be made here in that the B there's a huge B really problem that we have. And so it's like, you're either going to have to burn your A, some of your A or like figure this out. Right. And so like, I would love for the rest of my career to answer your question to help that. You know what I mean? It's like, you, I think you always want to leave something better than you found it. And I, everyone wants to be Michael Phelps or Tony Hawk or Kelly Slater or Magnus Carlson. Like these niche sports have these figureheads. And so everyone grows up and being like, da, 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 da. And it's like, well, you grew up and you were like Tyler McGill or Tom Shields. So fuck you. Like you failed, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, Hey man, like this, like be relay contingent um is like really high level of success right. that's such a few percentage of american swimmers will ever, will ever get to enjoy and there's been a somewhat broken culture around like prelim only um performance or prelim only medals and i think a lot of that is like my medal is identical to the individual ones or the night relay ones um and a lot of people get pissed about that and i think that's fine i think i was you know, I would, I would be kind of shitty about that when I was younger too. And I get why people are aggressive, but I think when it starts to infect like the team culture, like people's self-evaluation of themselves, um, which it just so obviously does. And like, I'll bring this up to national teamers or to user swimming staff or to people who are around the team area, you know what I mean? They're like, oh, what are you talking about? And it's like, dude, it's like, this is an important job. And as the swimming world becomes better, like we're seeing in the two fly right now for us, like you can't just have this one guy who holds the world record for 20 years and then retires. And then the next guy's going to come up. And like, I'm a huge believer in Trenton and Luca and Zach and Gunner, if he didn't quit was the name I was going to say there. <laughs> um, and I, I would love to see those guys develop. Um, but like, there's going to be some, like there needs to be some pointed, investment into picking up that slack behind Michael, especially now with Christoph and all these other guys going like 152. Right. And so in the same way with these relays, it's like, Hey, if we're going to swim these B guys, but we don't have any investment into B guys, then you're going to get these like random dudes who are on government assistance who aren't that good. On the, on the, on the other side of that, do you think if that means Tom Shields being left off the prelims relay, even though he was second at trials, do you think American mm -hmm. swimming is ready for that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> See, I think I was just left off a night relay when I'm near the, um, I am the fastest relay split ever at Worlds. Uh, I was fine with it. I was, you know what I mean? I think that was the call given the way TJ was swimming. Um, I think that that's, you know, difficult to swallow, obviously for like the community. But I think after the performances this summer, it's something that we do need to look at and, and think about. And it's like, everyone else is burning their A. I mean, they forcibly sat James Guy um to burn them in the prelims right and i know that's just one team but like we're getting to the point now where this is going to be the way things are unless we do have like pointed investment into our b guys right and that investment is sometimes money right, right. but it also is like make them better you know what i mean do whatever you do to make them better training camps high performance analysis yeah whatever so I think that's enough serious swimming talk for today. And so we're going to shift gears and play a game that we like to call Go With The Current. Tom, in honor of the amount of time you spent with your LA Current teammates this fall, which is more than you spent with your wife, uh, we are going to ask you to uh, answer some questions about your LA Current team. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So which LA Current teammate would you be most likely to go to dinner with in your downtime? Oh, I mean... Definitely like Lacone it was the guy I definitely did that the most with. So I'll just say that. Okay. Wow. Well, uh, which LA current teammate tells the best jokes? Uh, I don't know. This one's hard. I guess uh, Pinfold. Yeah. Brett made me laugh a lot. 
So I'll go with him for this one. Which LA current teammate tells the worst jokes? Oh, I did not know this was going to be a question. I walked into this one. Well, I'll just say myself to avoid any <laughs> drama here. Uh, which LA current teammate is the best dressed? Uh, oh, dude, our, our Viking, um, Tomo. Tomo. That guy's always steezing out. We'll have to pull a picture of that. <laughs> Uh, which LA current teammate is most likely to borrow your goggles and forget to return them? Uh, well, I shouldn't have burned myself on another one. You can, you can repeat. I will allow repeats. <laughs> Cause I will, I will say that that's that I do that. This is something that <laughs> that's Tom again. Um, which LA current teammate is most likely to become a Bitcoin billionaire? Uh, I mean, dude, Ryan's like invested to the, through the gills. Um, I don't know if he's about that life, uh, but I, he's the only one I talk to about that type of stuff. So we'll go with Murph. Murphy. Uh, which LA current teammate is most likely to be late to a team meeting? Let's see who would be the latest. <laughs> so there's multiple, multiple answers. I mean, I'm late. Um, so this is hard for me to answer. Uh, who gets there after you? Oh, dude, nobody. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm just I'm late to everything. Um, that's Dirt and Nor Marsh. Like, I'm late to every practice. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't mean to be like I'm gonna pick myself for all the negative ones, but another another question that I can't really answer outside of myself. All right, and who- all right, yeah, how about Marsh? Marsh is some oftentimes later than me to me. Well, you guys are both on California time. I mean, it's yeah. an LA team. You can't expect anybody to be on yeah, time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which LA current teammate is most likely to change the world? You know, I think like, um, I'm a big believer in uh, Beryl, you know? And I think that she's had a rough go of it for a few years, obviously. But I think that like, if she can get some her feet under her and in a consistent environment, I think that she'll go on to do great things. Cool. Well, thanks, Tom. <laughs> thanks, Tom. I appreciate you taking the time to come on the Swim Swam podcast today. Yeah, thanks, bud. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.